Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look at the top stories in the coming week from our Daybreak anchors all around the world. And straight ahead on the program, a look at the March jobs report here in the U.S. and what it means for Fed policy. I'm Tom Busby in New York. I'm Caroline Hepke here in London, where we're asking if the European Central Bank has won its battle against inflation. I'm Brian Curtis in Hong Kong. I'll look ahead to China's PMIs and whether the PBOC wants to use the Chinese currency to juice the economy. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend on Bloomberg 1130 New York, Bloomberg 991 Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 1061 Boston, Bloomberg 960 San Francisco, DAB Digital Radio London, Sirius XM 119, and around the world on BloombergRadio.com and via the Bloomberg Business app. Good day to you. I'm Tom Busby, and we begin today's program with the March jobs report. We get those numbers this coming Friday. What does this mean for Fed policy going forward? Well, for more, we're joined by Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. Now, Michael, we saw blowout gains in January, strong growth in February, even though the unemployment rate ticked a little higher, 3.9 percent. What are you expecting to see for March this Friday? Pretty much the same thing. <laughs> I don't want to make it sound boring, but uh, we have no indication that the labor market has fallen off. And right now, the forecast consensus from economists surveyed by Bloomberg is for about 215, 216,000. Uh, that would be down from the prior month. But we haven't really been sure about what the numbers would be in some time because they keep coming in stronger than anticipated. So if we see something similar to that again, it would be mixed news for the Fed in that they want people to get jobs and it's good for the economy. But uh, the question is, becomes, is it inflationary? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, so a surprise to the upside would be no surprise, but it could hurt things. Uh, let's talk about uh, another thing that's Average hourly earnings, and what are we looking for there? And that will what will that tell us about inflation? And yeah, uh, average hourly earnings has been the Fed's focus in these jobs numbers because they're looking at whether or not employers are still having to pay up to attract employees and then raise prices to cover that. Uh, right now, we're looking for a jump in average hourly earnings and no change in a year over year basis, four point three percent. That's good for workers. It's above inflation. Uh, Inflation-adjusted wages have been rising over 1% for the past some months. So that's, uh, on, from the worker side, good news, but it still concerns the Fed in terms of is that what's pushing up service industry prices in particular, which has been a big contributor to uh, the fact that they can't get inflation down to 2% yet. No, not yet. And another concern for the Fed is is the uh, unemployment rate. Now, we know it's 3.9 percent for February. They're expecting 3.8, still below what they view as an appropriate level, 4.1, right? Well, the Fed thought we would get to 4.1 uh, this year. They thought we would get to 4.1 last year, and we didn't. <laughs> the unemployment rate has continued to surprise the Fed. Uh, one of the questions is going to come with uh, the labor force participation rate. We have seen more people entering the labor force, which is one reason that unemployment rose from its low of 3.5 to now this 3.9%. And that could be a reason for us to go over 4 Nobody thinks we're going to go significantly over four, but it's been a while since we've been there. So there's a feeling at some point we have to go back uh, to around that level because the Fed and most economists think we are below the natural rate of unemployment. We're still at a level at which uh, we see inflationary pressures because there's not enough people to take all the jobs. Well, now, uh, 15 million jobs added since Biden took office. How is this momentum carrying his the perception of his economy, Bidenomics. It's starting to get better. We've had some numbers on consumer sentiment. They've been up but down just a little bit, but people are feeling pretty good still about the labor force, and that's because they have jobs, and if they have jobs, they can go out and spend. And the economy is growing faster than had been anticipated this year. So it's uh, a reason, perhaps, that we have seen some of the polls turn around for President Biden. But you need to keep it going, and that's the question is, is this going to continue? 
Yeah, November, still a long way away. Well, let's talk about some of the jobs that we're seeing growth and some of the jobs where we're losing a little steam. Well, last month we lost uh, some manufacturing jobs, which had been expected for some time and hadn't shown up yet because the ISM numbers, uh, other measures of manufacturing have suggested a slowdown. Uh, so we'll watch manufacturing payrolls, uh, but most of the jobs are still being created in the health services industry, and that's expected to continue for quite some time as America ages. We need more people to help take care of them. Uh, so that a rise there is not a surprise. A rise in leisure and hospitality would not be a surprise. Those jobs turn over fairly quickly, and we've never really gotten back all the jobs at bars, restaurants, and hotels that we lost during the pandemic. After that... You'd want to look at something like retail to see if companies are still uh, feeling like Americans are going to shop enough to add workers. Uh, we've gotten through now January, February, where the extra help they hire for the holiday season uh, gets let go. Uh, are they still letting go people or are we going to see a rise in uh, retail uh, payrolls? That's going to be something to watch as well. And also another uh, economic indicator, construction jobs. Construction jobs have been interesting because the builders can't build houses fast enough. There's so much demand for new homes. And they have been able to find workers. Construction jobs have been rising. And so that's a consideration. Do we still see uh, construction jobs rising? And this, this kind of plays into the whole debate, too, about immigration in the, the presidential race because a lot of uh, undocumented immigrants are taking construction jobs. Yeah. And without them, you wouldn't have the ability to build as many homes. So there's some good news, bad news in that. Well, our thanks to Michael McKee, Bloomberg's international economics and policy correspondent. Well, we move now to the Walt Disney Company's annual meeting of shareholders. It'll be held on April 3rd. It's usually an uneventful affair, but not this year. Activist investor, Tryon Fund Management founder Nelson Peltz going up against Disney CEO Bob Iger looking for a seat on Disney's board. And for more on what's turned out to be a battle royale, we're joined by Thomas Buckley, Bloomberg News entertainment reporter. So, Thomas, lay it out. What is behind this fight for at least one board seat at Disney? Well, as you said, Tom, I think that um, in previous years, it's been a pretty uneventful affair, the Disney annual general meeting. I think that it couldn't be more eventful. In fact, this year, Nelson Peltz's try and fund management, the activist firm, has accumulated a stake in Disney worth about $3.5 billion and has been lobbying for board seats for the better half of almost two years now. And even a couple of weeks ago, it looked like, um, you know, Disney had turned in a very strong earnings report, and it seemed as though momentum on the Tryon and Nelson Pelt side had really slowed. But since then, we've seen a number of people step out in support of Peltz. Now, that includes directors on the boards of companies where he's previously served as a director, including Procter & Gamble, Mondelez, Janice Henderson, and more. And now we have proxy advisors, ISS and Egan Jones also supporting his candidacy for a board seat. So what seemed like an, maybe an early victory for Disney is maybe now looking a bit more like a contest. Well, what is the problem that he has with Iger and the direction of the Disney company? What does he want to see changed? I think there are a number of issues that try and lay, laid out in a 133-page white paper recently. Now, he focuses on really the lack of oversight and accountability at the board level, which he claims has been the case for most of Disney's recent history. I think that Disney has taken steps to address a number of the complaints, or you could say arguments, laid out in the white paper. For example, it's appointed former Morgan Stanley CEO James Gorman to its board, and also former Sky CEO Jeremy Director aid in a succession planning process. Obviously, we'll remember that the succession planning process, as carried out by the board for the CEO that preceded Bob Iger, so Bob Chapek, um, who lasted a little less than three years in the role, was not successful, which is why Bob Iger had to return. Since his return in 2022, his contract has been extended all the way out to 2026. So I think that Nelson probably feels as though the board could be doing a better job, certainly in areas of succession planning and accountability. 
Well, now, you talked about the support that Peltz has, but uh, let's talk about the support that Iger has won from Glass Lewis, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon, and big names like Laureen Powell Jobs, Star Wars director George Lucas, a favorite of many people, and also the Disney family. How does that backing affect, you know, what's going to happen this week? Well, I think that's really interesting because fundamentally we're seeing both sides marshal support. Um, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how you would argue necessarily the credibility of Glass Lewis versus the credibility of ISS versus the credibility of Egon Jones. I mean, these people are all very much in the same game of speaking to shareholders and um, speaking to the companies and seeking to really, I suppose, improve governance of the companies that they monitor. Um, I think the fact that a number of these proxy advisors are split speaks volumes probably about the shareholder base being split. I think that the support from Jamie Dimon um, would probably sway a number of institutional shareholders. The support from the likes of George Lucas, um, as you said at Star Wars, um, probably might sway a number of retail shareholders. Um, but I think that certainly the support for Tryan from a number of directors where Nelson's also served on the board might sway some disgruntled institutional shareholders who maybe bought Disney at the top, you know, around 2021 and feel as though a bit of um, agitas is what's needed at the company. Well, a Tryon Fund controls about $3.5 billion of Disney stock. How big a slice is that holding? And, and how much sway does that give Peltz and Tryon? Well, the holding has certainly grown over time. So when Nelson first disclosed stake in the business at the time of Bob Iger's return in November 2022, the stake was worth anywhere between $800 to $900 million. Um, it has grown materially over time because it includes now shares pledged by the former chairman of Marvel Entertainment, Ike Perlmutter, who was fired unceremoniously by Iger last year. To give you a bit of context, I mean, that $3.5 billion stake um, compares to a market cap of about $221 million. So on that front, it's a pretty meaningful, sizable stake. Um, certainly a shareholder that if it were anybody other than Nelson or Tryon, I think that the board would probably be very much engaging with behind the scenes, given the size of the, of the voting power. I think that it gives, naturally, Tryon a a bit of credibility i mean it's it's a huge stake to have in any business especially one in the world's largest entertainment company well that virtual shareholder meeting this coming wednesday and our thanks to thomas buckley bloomberg news entertainment reporter for his insights and coming up on bloomberg daybreak weekend we'll talk about whether the european central bank has won its battle against inflation i'm tom busby and this is bloomberg This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. Up later in our program, how close is the U.S. Senate to passing a bill that would force TikTok's parent company to either sell the app or be banned in the U.S.? But first, after the latest rounds of central bank rate decisions, investors are placing their bets on summer rate cuts. But one thing stands in the way, the data, one of the most important metrics is inflation in the EU. The higher for longer strategy was originally adopted by policymakers around the world in a bid to rein in soaring inflation levels. Is that fight over? European core inflation data due next week may provide the biggest clue yet. And for more, let's go to London and bring in Bloomberg Daybreak Europe anchor Caroline Hepker. Tom, so far in 2024, economists, CEOs and central bankers have all been consumed by one question. When will interest rates come down? In Europe, rates have reached their highest point since the global financial crisis in 2008. And yet the ECB has held interest rates steady at 4.5% since September of last year, even in the face of growing market pressure. There is a glimmer of hope, though. In a statement released following its last interest rate decision, the ECB said inflation projections have been revised down, in particular for 2024, which mainly reflects a lower contribution from energy prices. Now, the central bank has set itself a target of reducing inflation to 2% across all European countries combined, and officials might be closer than they think. 
According to Bloomberg's recent nowcast of inflation, Eurozone inflation already sits at 2%. The gauge compiled by Bloomberg Economics incorporates 32 variables, ranging from unemployment to those energy costs I mentioned, and it has hit 1.95% after a drop in January producer prices fed into the model. The figure is subject to change because of the nature of the now cast, but the drop speaks to a broader trend of falling European inflation. In fact, it's been on a downward trend for months as energy prices dip and the 20-country eurozone economy stagnates for a second year in a row. So lower inflation should lead to lower interest rates, at least according to ECB President Christine Lagarde, who said in a recent speech that the decisions of the central bank regarding rate cuts would be guided by economic data. Domestic price pressures will still be visible. We expect services inflation, for example, to remain elevated for most of this year. So there will be a period ahead where we need to confirm on an ongoing basis that the incoming data supports our inflation outlook. So this has two important implications for the policy path ahead, two important implications. First, our decisions will have to remain data dependent and decided meeting by meeting, responding to new information as it comes in. This implies that even after the first rate cut, we cannot, we cannot pre-commit to a particular rate path. However tempting that is, however much some of you would like to see it, if we are honest to our methodology and if we have discipline in adhering to these principles, We cannot. That was the first important implication. The second important implication is that our policy framework will remain important to process the incoming data and calibrate the appropriate policy stance. Inflation outlook, dynamics of underlying inflation, transmission of monetary policy. But at the same time, the relative weights assigned to the three criteria will have to be regularly examined. That was the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, speaking at the ECB and its Watchers conference earlier this month. It's not all good news, though. Underlying price pressures, particularly from salaries in the services sector, are still relatively high, a potential indicator that the trend towards slowing inflation could change. It's one of the reasons that the ECB continues to emphasise that rate cuts come only once they are sure that wage restraint is taking effect and that inflation and its slowdown is actually here to stay. Because of this, European central bankers aren't declaring victory just yet. They have talked about most measures of underlying inflation having eased further, but domestic price pressures remaining high. Now, one group hoping to see falling inflation next week will be investors who are pricing in a 90% chance of an ECB rate cut by June. I was discussing this point with BlackRock's senior investment strategist, Laura Cooper. So we'll be watching for whether that broadening, that upside kind Mm -hmm. of price pressures persist in March. But I don't think that's necessarily going to deviate the ECB away from a June rate cut. I think because at that point, Christine Lagarde made it quite clear that they will have sufficient data to have more confidence that inflation is on that sustained trajectory back to 2%. So we're still leaning towards this rate cut in June and then a very gradual pace through the end of the year, because essentially they may not want to cut back to back because for fear of markets essentially extrapolating out that easing trend and markets could anticipate them getting back to neutral much sooner than what they actually want to to kind of guide markets towards. That was BlackRock's Laura Cooper. Now we are expecting data for inflation out of Europe in the next few days to examine what they could mean for the future path of rate cuts. Bloomberg's ECB reporter Alexander Weber has been speaking to me about what exactly we're expecting from those figures. Yeah, we expect the number to come in roughly at a similar level as in February, meaning um, uh, around 2.6. There are some, including Bloomberg Economics, who forecast a slight decline to 2.4. So all of that is in line with the expectation that um, inflation will continue to slow, but at a slower pace than what we've seen in in recent months. Does the CPI number tell us the whole story, do you think, about the inflation picture? At the moment, there's 
a bigger focus also on the core number again that is still higher than the headline number which has been driven lower by energy um, at the core the driving forces are really uh, services so that's where a lot of the focus is we also um, expect a slight decline in in the core inflation number to 2.9 so still uh, reasonably above the two percent target that the ecb is eyeing um, have there been indicators then that in the, the slowdown in inflation is actually substantial on here to say there are some concerns about potentially a spike higher once inflation does actually dip that it then could rebound? There could be a rebound in the second half of the year. So even if um, inflation hits 2% around the middle of the year, which is what some uh, forecasters are saying, that doesn't mean the inflation fight is really over. So the ECB wants to see inflation stay sustainably at the 2% uh, level. Um, and that may not be really the case until next year so um, that's partly because there's energy costs have been so volatile on the account of government measures that are now being phased out that all makes for a very bumpy path down to the two percent target mm, okay so a bumpy path but how much bearing also do you think that the individual figures next week are going to actually have on the ecb's first rate decision so we have a rate decision on April 11. The officials have already pretty clearly guided us toward a cut in June. So nobody's really expecting any action in April. The inflation figure and is probably not going to change all that much about it. What officials are really waiting for is wage data for the first quarter. And that doesn't come in until um, May, even early June. Um, that's when we have the real certainty about what's going on in the economy and uh, the crucial wage data that people are waiting for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, do you think the markets are pricing in interest rate cuts and the curve of rate cuts too aggressively for the rest of the year? What's our view? That is very difficult to say at the moment. So markets are pricing around four cuts. Um, there's been very little clarity on what happens after June. Um, some officials have said um, that expectations are about reasonable where they are now. On the other hand, the environment is so uncertain that nobody wants to really um, be too concrete about the path for interest rates down. Um, the views seem to be diverging quite a lot at the moment and a lot will just depend on the data, how it comes in, whether there's going to be breaks on the way down and then um, how things develop in the fall. That's when we're going to have more clarity. At the moment, there's really a high level of uncertainty. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the deposit rate for the ECB is at a higher 4%. So yes, the kind of clarity on how that comes down is, is quite uncertain. Just talk to us a bit about European services. Um, could this be a cause for inflation perhaps to remain sticky? Is that the main worry that we've seen in terms of um, the, the um, inflation rate for the 20 area Eurozone? Yeah, services is absolutely key at the moment because it's so labor intensive and that means wages are, play, are playing a much bigger role than in other sectors of the economy. And the labor market is still very tight, especially in light of the economic weakness that we've seen. Uh, there's even been a recession in Germany in all likelihood, but still the labor market has held up very well. And if an economic rebound really materializes now in the coming quarters, um, that means the labor market is probably not going to soften any further. Mm -hmm. So uh, wages are really um, where it's at. Demands from labor unions are still very elevated. And uh, we have to see whether they can um, realize these demands, what companies are saying, um, whether they give in. And services yeah. are really um, the key. Yeah, absolutely. Alexander, how does Europe compare globally then? I mean, is Europe actually approaching the 2% inflation target? It does seem to be that there's been a convergence in recent weeks around the view you know, of the Fed, and the Bank of England, the ECB, all cutting interest rates around the same time in June. Is that what you're seeing in the data? How likely is that to, to remain in place, that idea of convergence? Yeah, it does seem like that at the moment. There was for a while, there was the worry that, um, especially in the US, where the economy is just uh, stronger, uh, that the Fed may not be able to cut as soon. And then the question is, 
always what does that mean for the ecb does the ecb dare to go first or do they want to avoid that kind of divergence which of course has some uh, impact on the exchange rate and so on um, but at the moment it does seem um, also when you listen to what uh, fed officials are saying jerome powell is still uh, guiding for a cut this year then um, it does seem like convergence is still the most likely scenario That was Alexander Webb, a Bloomberg's ECB reporter. They're speaking to me around the inflation data we're expecting from Europe and what it might mean for the ECB. My thanks to him for joining me. I'm Caroline Hepke here in London. You can catch us every weekday morning for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, beginning at 6am in London. That's 1am on Wall Street. Tom. Well, thank you, Caroline. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, a look at the social media app TikTok. Will the app be allowed to stay in the U.S.? or get banned. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. I'm Tom Busby in New York with your global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. After passing in the House, the U.S. Senate now working on a bill that would force TikTok's Chinese parent company to either sell the app or be banned in the U.S. on national security concerns. For more, let's get to Bloomberg Daybreak Asia co-host Doug Krisner. Tom, the Senate will return from recess in a week. Before the break, the chair of the Commerce Committee, Maria Cantwell, said she's considering a public hearing on the TikTok bill. You may know that it passed the House back in March, and the president has said he's willing to sign it. For a closer look at what may be next, I'm joined in the San Francisco studio by Bloomberg's Asia Counts. She covers social media. She's also a member of the Technology America's West team. Thanks for stopping by. I'm glad we could do this. One of the things that I've read is that this bill has already run into several roadblocks in the Senate, and it doesn't seem as though there's a great deal of consensus on how to approach whatever issues are at stake here. Is there any agreement, though, that you're aware of? Is there commonality? I think that Congress can agree that there needs to be some sort of data privacy legislation. Again, like you said, they disagree on what exactly that would look like. But we've really seen Congress come together around this TikTok stuff and mobilize in a way that they haven't been able to do for a host of other issues. One of the arguments against an outright ban has to do with the violation of the First Amendment. Are you hearing that that has any kind of traction as a as a rebuttal to this move to ban TikTok? I mean, it seems like all the rebuttals that may have come, and, and TikTok has used that argument themselves, haven't really seemed to gain ground. But that is one that, that TikTok has used, that these users, these 170 million Americans, should have the right to be able to share their voices and their stories and to hear other people's voices and stories as well. One of the fascinating things about this story is the way in which TikTok was able to rally the users together to turn them into effectively lobbyists, reaching out to members of Congress, pushing back on this legislation. And in a weird way, it feels as though they made the point themselves showing, illustrating the extent to which this platform is so prevalent and has so much influence. I agree. I think in some ways it actually backfired on TikTok because of that exact reason. You were able to see them influence and sort of mobilize 170 million people. And that was sort of an example of how the app could be used. You imagine it being used in a more malicious way of how the app could be weaponized. This is not the first time, as we know, that the move has taken place in Washington to try to ban this app. During the Trump administration, It seemed like the administration got pretty close. And one of the things that ended up happening was the firm Oracle Corporation was given the ability to house a lot of the data on servers here in the United States as a way of addressing the concern about this level of national security and potential breach of of that type of sensitive information. That doesn't seem to have gone far enough, but what do we know about what Oracle is doing to try to keep a hand or a handle on this data in a safe way? Yeah, it's really interesting because the concern was that the Chinese government at any time could compel TikTok to release like national security related data so that they could release data on American users. And so the solution was what you're talking about, which is Project Texas, where Oracle is storing all the data of American users on American soil. How effective that is, it's it's hard to tell. I think the arguments about product 
Project Texas really insulating TikTok from China have not convinced Congress. They still have felt like Chinese employees at ByteDance or the Chinese government can have access. So it hasn't really moved the needle from their perspective, but it's gone further than most tech companies. When you look at the pushback, one of the things I think was very interesting, and Vice President Kamala Harris made this point very recently about the degree to which this platform is responsible for supporting small businesses. There are a number of users of TikTok that have really grown businesses by virtue of this app. And there is a real, I guess, a case to be made that you don't want to stifle that type of innovation, right? I mean, it, that in and of itself doesn't like seem to be a very strong case. And I think it's something that people will consider, particularly in the context of this public hearing, right? It's a real consequence of the app going away. I think about retail or, or beauty. There are all kinds of products that go viral on TikTok, and then you can sustain a small business off of that. Um, so I think it's a very real argument to be made. Again, I'm not sure how much sway that argument will have, um, but it is real. And aside from that, there are thousands, if not millions, of creators, individual people that are creating content and able to make a living off of it. I've, I've talked to some of them myself. When you consider the fact that the algorithm is really the, you know, the golden key here, okay, it's one thing to talk about housing data. It's another thing about uh, really gaining access to this algorithm. It's been so effective at helping to drive users into the content that they would be most interested in. There's probably not a way where Beijing would allow something like that to fall in American hands. Am I right or I'm wrong? I mean, I wouldn't want to allow that, right? I mean, the the explosive growth of TikTok is because of the algorithm. You go on and it kind of knows you better than you know yourself in some ways. And you and you finds out your interests and it's incredibly effective at that. So I would not want that to fall into someone else's hands. It's important to remember, too, that this is not the first move to ban TikTok in a country. India, two years ago, was very successful. They moved very quickly. And it wasn't just TikTok that was banned. I think 58 different apps created by Chinese firms were also banned from the Indian market. That said, at that point, TikTok really hadn't developed that much traction in India to become a threat to ByteDance. Totally different story in the U.S., right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all these tech companies sort of behind the scenes have been lobbying for TikTok to be banned because it would benefit them. You think about Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, they all benefit um, if TikTok gets banned. And then there is this sort of tension of like Facebook is, ba- is banned in China, and it's been banned for almost a decade. So you kind of see this back and forth between different countries. Asia, thank you so much for making time to chat with us. At Bloomberg's Asia Counts, she covers social media and is a member of the Technology Americas team. Now let's pivot to China. We move to Hong Kong next. And co-host Brian Curtis. Doug, China's PMIs may show further improvement in one key area of the economy. We'll get the numbers for March in the coming week. The official PMI is projected to come in at 50.1, back in expansion after last month's reading of 49.1. But clearly more work is needed to get the Chinese economy buzzing. Some investors had worried that China might be poised to allow the Chinese currency to weaken to add support. But then traders were confused by some back-and-forth movements in the PBOC's reference rate fixes. Joining us now for some clarity on this is Tanya Chen, a specialist on FX and rates for Bloomberg News. So, Tanya, policymakers first triggered a yuan sell-off partially by weakening that rate before then causing a rebound via some stronger settings in the next couple of days. What do we know? The yuan fix, which obviously is the clear signal that the PBOC can send in terms of what it's trying to signal around the currency, um, the rebuttal last week showed that perhaps the initial tolerance for letting the currency slightly weaken in the yuan fix, um, perhaps equity markets reaction was not what they had hoped for. And so some investors are actually saying the sentiment actually hasn't stabilized around the currency. And the PBOC it was perceived by the investment community that perhaps the PBOC was allowing the currency to decline ahead of the Fed, which is expected to ease later this year. And that was seen as a positive. However, due to how the markets sold off on that, the PBOC PBOC quickly reined it back in the days following by issuing much stronger fixes. And from that, we saw kind of the currency um, strengthen, but then and also state banks coming back into the market and trying to defend the currency around this 7.2 line. Do we have a general sense that the PBOC wants to loosen their grip a bit on the currency or uh, just the reverse? 
I think there's a couple of factors that the PBC needs to consider. Obviously, the general sentiment around the economy right now is fairly gloomy, given what we've seen around the macroeconomic data. Yes, we've seen a few green shoots appearing. However, the PBOC is trying to manage a very stable currency depreciation around the currency, but also around its main trading partners. And actually, if you were to look kind of across the sea where the Japanese yen is trading, you know that it's also fairly weak, even after the Bank of Japan had hiked rates earlier this month. And so there's a couple of factors that the POBC needs to take into account. And obviously, the widening yield interest rate differential between the yuan and also the U.S. rates is one to consider, considering that the PBOC's economy is so on the back foot that most of the market is expecting the central bank to either lower uh, interest rates later this year or to at least loosen the economy some more. Is there any sort of line in the sand for authorities on the yuan? So after the PBOC came back and reined the currency by setting stronger fixes last week, the currency was trading roughly weaker than 7.2, which was a line that they had actually fixed and maintained for the last six months or so. By allowing the currency to tread slightly weaker than 7.2 shows that perhaps there is some slight signal that they're allowing the currency to marginally depreciate. We know that the last major cap that the PBOC had enforced was 7.3, and that was a line that they held most of late last year and also last summer, when you saw that the reference rate with from estimates was over 1,300 pips. And that was quite a strong signal to the market that they were enforcing a specific line. However, if you take another step back and you look at just what the implied volatility markets are telling you about the general sentiment towards the currency right now, you're seeing that volatility is actually not as elevated as what we had seen when the currency was weakening around 7.3, nor is it as high as it was during the trade war in 2018 or when it was devalued at 2015. So taking all of this and taking this step back, actually the kind of bearishness around the currency is still slightly maintained. What's odd about this is that it seems like the PBOC is fixing uh, is meant to be and has been one of the more transparent parts of China's currency regime. And now a lot of that seems to be a little bit up in the air. That's right. And I think that's also indicative of how they've been issuing monetary policy as of late as well. So we had seen officials coming ahead of certain announcements, such as cutting the reserve requirement ratio. The way that they're managing communication around the currency could potentially track with how they're also managing the monetary policy in that they're potentially trying to catch traders off guard. And that might be a more effective way of getting what they need to be done in the market. Tanya, thanks so much for joining us. Tanya Chen, a specialist on FX and rates for Bloomberg News. I'm Brian Curtis in Hong Kong, along with Doug Krisner. You can catch us every weekday here for Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, beginning at 8 a.m. in Hong Kong and 8 p.m. on Wall Street. Tom? Thank you, Brian. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend. Join us again Monday morning at 5 a.m. Wall Street time for the latest on markets overseas and the news you need to start your day. I'm Tom Busby. Stay with us. Top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now.